Leadership. All my life, I've been fascinated by what makes a good leader. Are good leaders born or made? Can leadership be taught? How do leaders lead if people don't trust to even listen? I grew up in Arkansas. Now I live and work in the innovation heartland of Northern California. During these last years of constant crisis, I've thought more deeply about leadership and what it takes to lead people, especially when trust is in limited supply. That's why I decided to create this podcast and reach out to changemakers from different disciplines to hear what they have to say. As the host of this show, the most important things I can do are two things I learned in medical school, to ask good questions and then listen. Hello, I'm Lloyd Miner, Dean of the Stanford School of Medicine, and welcome back to the Miner Consult. It's a privilege to welcome this week's guest, the editor-at-large for LinkedIn News and host of LinkedIn News Live, Caroline Fairchild. Through her daily live show, weekly newsletter, and leadership of LinkedIn's global news team, Caroline reaches millions of readers and viewers, providing news and insights on leadership and the evolving American workplace. She has interviewed an array of leaders and visionaries, including Melinda Gates, Sheryl Sandberg, and Warren Buffett. Beyond LinkedIn, you may have seen her work in Fortune, The New York Times, Bloomberg Business Week, and CNBC, among many other publications. Notably, she was named to Forbes 30 Under 30 in 2018 for her trailblazing work in media. Thank you so much for joining me, Caroline. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. I'm happy to be here. I'm always interested to hear what inspired leaders to go into their chosen fields. Can you share when you knew you wanted to pursue journalism and what keeps you in journalism? Yeah, of course. Uh, well, thank you again for the opportunity uh, to be on your, your show. I'm a big fan. So like many journalists, uh, my inspiration to go into journalism started with just a love of writing. Uh, when I was started writing when I was a very young kid, my most notable first publication was a list of ways to avoid my older brother, Jimmy, that I wrote um, when I was uh, you know, just learning to write. Uh, so I've always really enjoyed writing. Um, and then really was my experience working um, at the student newspaper at Duke uh, when I was in college. I was the local national editor uh, during the time that um, Barack Obama was running for president. And so covering the, that election uh, for, for the student newspaper was a highlight. And from there, I kind of realized that I really enjoyed just giving people information and insight into people and into topics that they may not understand or, or may not have access to. And so that really kind of experience facilitated this love that I have of, of getting access to some of the brightest minds in business in particular, and then sharing those insights more broadly. You've spoken to some of the world's most successful business leaders. What's a favorite moment from those interviews? <laughs> Many favorite moments. I mean, you mentioned Melinda Gates. I was actually just thinking about that that interview earlier this morning. I'm doing a, some reporting right now um, with some people in Seattle, and I remember that that interview was a few years ago. I, I, I traveled to Seattle for that interview, um, and I was extremely nervous, as one might be, when they sit down with someone like Melinda Gates. Um, but I, I, you know, so and when that ha when that happens, I often try and think about ways that I can even if the person is like a Melinda Gates level and feels like they are, you know, at a completely different height of their career than I am. I always try and think of ways at the beginning that I can relate to them or they can relate to me. So it kind of breaks the ice a little bit. Uh, and so I remember I, I noticed that like, my, like myself, um, Melinda also went to Duke University and um, she actually got two degrees from Duke. So she got um, a business degree as well as her undergrad at Duke. And at Duke, we have a a term for that is called double dookie. And I, when I sat down, you know, we only had a few minutes before the interview and I sat down with her, I said, so, so I, you know, I, I see you're a double dookie. I went to Duke as well. And she kind of goes, she goes, double dookie, what is that? <laughs> and she had never heard the term. Um, and I, I remember it because it's, it's just one of those things where it's like, I, I, I taught her something, someone like Melinda Gates, um, you know, and so that kind of got us off on like a funny foot, but also made me realize that we're all humans. We all, we all have things that we know and we don't know. Um, and, and that was a great, great moment. That's great. I, I've read uh, that you, you, there are only two things you're more passionate about than uh, business and, and management and leadership, and that is Duke basketball and dogs. Uh, yes, so yes. how are both doing? 
<laughs> my dog Larry is a highlight of my day. I particularly love that I get to spend more time with him now that we're working from home a little bit more often. And it's a historic year for Duke basketball. It's the last year that Coach K um, is 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 um, in the head coach seat. I actually got to go see a game um, when they were in Madison Square Garden earlier this year. And so yeah, it's a bittersweet year, but I, I think we're, we we have good prospects going into March Madness. So I'm excited about that. Fantastic. If you could interview any leader from business or otherwise, who would it be and why? Yeah, I gave this one some thought. It's it's a hard one, and it's it's a funny because it's a question that I get asked a lot, and I feel like it is constantly evolving and changing. Um, I would probably have to say Jacinda Ardern, um, who is you know doing such an incredible job of, of leading a country through this pandemic. I I was able to sit down with her prior to the coronavirus. Um, very, very briefly at a conference. It was like a three, three, four minute, very quick interview. Um, and I think that of, of all the people who I could talk to at this point in terms of leadership traits, how to lead with compassion, with empathy, particularly at this point in the pandemic, she would be top of mind for me. The internet and social media have forever changed how we get our information. And news outlets in particular have struggled to keep up with these changes. In many ways though, you're changing that narrative through the many uh, uh, outlets that you're leading and, and the, indeed the, the modes of communication that you've introduced. What, what would you say it takes to lead successful media organizations today in the digital age? And is there a philosophy that you subscribe to that should guide the leaders of media? It's a big question. Uh, I think, you know, going back to your question around what, what inspired me to go into the media industry, part of it was the fact that it is constantly evolving and changing. I, I, I tend to find that my, my favorite types of modes of work are when we are trying to accelerate into one change or another. And that certainly is something that I've had a lot of experience with um, throughout my time working in media. It's actually what inspired me to come to LinkedIn in the first place. Uh, I started my career at more traditional publications, Bloomberg, um, the Huffington Post and Fortune. And I, I just saw that the way that people were receiving information, where they were getting their news, what types of news that they were looking for was moving more and more increasingly to social media. And so when our editor-in-chief, Dan Roth, reached out to me, gosh, seven years ago, um, saying that he was starting a newsroom and there were you know, fewer than 10 people on the team, would I want to join? I, I kind of just jumped because I, I had so many great opportunities at Fortune. It's really where I cut my teeth as a business journalist. Um, but you know, it was like every other day there was a layoff. The magazine was getting shorter and shorter with each cycle that we did. And I just saw that there was an opportunity to you know, innovate and, and really build something from the ground up. And so that's what brought me to LinkedIn. Um, in terms of, of leadership traits that I, I think of when I think of media organizations, I really do credit um, you know, leaders like Dan Roth who were able to kind of see a little bit further ahead of where things were going. Uh, if you can believe it, like when he reached out to me seven years ago, I had no idea why he was reaching out to me. The, 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 the fact that LinkedIn would have a newsroom was such just a, a foreign concept to me. Uh, when I heard what he was seeing and kind of the trends that he was, that I was you know, seeing anecdotally, but he was seeing from the ground up, uh, I, I saw that that really was something that I wanted to be a part of. And so in terms of leadership traits, I think you always have to be thinking ahead, two steps ahead, three steps ahead, because the way that people are consuming media right now is going to be very different in a year and drastically different in five years. So, so having that long-term vision and, and really being able to spot trends early on. If we build a little bit on that thread of the relationship between news and social media, how can we improve the experience of social media today? A common criticism is that many platforms have moved away from building meaningful connections toward more attention mining and, and attention controlling. Uh, what's your response to that? My response is I, I'm a victim to that attention mining and trolling. I, I spend way too much time on TikTok now and, and I feel gross every time that I close the app because I feel like I've just wasted so much time. Uh, but my other response to that is we're just seeing the exact opposite on LinkedIn. Um, a colleague of mine, Callie Schweitzer, recently called LinkedIn a platform of generosity and how what we're seeing on LinkedIn is People come to LinkedIn because they want to find meaningful connections, they want to find information that's gonna advance them in their career, or they are looking for, for opportunities uh, for where they want their career to advance. And so when you come to LinkedIn and you spend time with us, you leave 
probably feeling pretty good about yourself because it's not this like toxic clickbaity content where you kind of feel like you've wasted time. But instead, if you give us five minutes, you know, and, and read some of the stories in our news module or catch up on a LinkedIn learning course or, you know, s send off a quick note to a professional connection who you haven't seen in quite some time, that feels good and it feels empowering. Um, so, so at LinkedIn, I think we're really focused on that as our value prop. How do we ensure that you, you, you feel you, you one know that the information that you're seeing in our feed is trusted, but two, that you leave feeling better about yourself than when you came. And over the course of the last seven years, I've watched as the product has just only improved that experience. And, and I think, you know, I, I wouldn't be a journalist working for a social media company if it were any other way. Uh, so, so that's what I have to say about that. Well, Caroline, as you've said, no field has faced more disruption from the digital revolution than media. How do you think this space will continue to evolve over the next five to 10 years? And what are the key indicators of change that you'll be watching? Right. So I think right now, one of the biggest trends that we're watching, particularly um, on the editorial team at LinkedIn, is just the massive growth of the creator economy. Uh, you know, the, the diversion of this story that played out seven years ago is that, you know, we started to see this disruption of traditional gatekeepers of information, um, you know, you think back, like think that the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, these legacy publications really being the, in, you know, decades ago, some of the few places you could go to gain, to gain access to information. And then we saw this huge surge of online publications right when I joined the workforce in 2012, BuzzFeed, HuffPost, you name it. And now there seems to be thousands and thousands of places that you can go to get your news. And so right now, that, that's kind of the trend that has followed me for the first half of my career. And now what I'm seeing is this, this trend of just disintermediation even further as, as we have so many creators who are creating their own content. They might not be traditional journalists, but they are, you know, it, uh, sharing information with their audiences, building massive audiences off platforms like LinkedIn. And so, you know, as we right now on the editorial team at LinkedIn, we're building out a community management team. And so we're seeing massive growth in that space. And I think we're thinking constantly about how we can build more creators into the information that we're, we're, we're showing on the platform to kind of make LinkedIn a, a better place. Um, so that's probably the biggest trend that I'm following right now. What type of outlets or feedback do you depend upon as you shape the platform? Because that's one of the things throughout your career you've done, certainly at LinkedIn, but even before, is to work within the space you're working, but, but to customize the content and the approaches so that it has the most meaning to those who are watching or viewing or reading uh, uh, what you're producing. What, what do you look for in order to calibrate and plan where you're going to go in the future? I think I think a lot of this comes down to content type. Um, I think you know when I started out in journalism, there was particularly when I was at Bloomberg, um, there was a lot of emphasis put on you know the traditional skills that you need to write a good long form article, right? But as we know, particularly as more generations come come up in the workforce, not not every conversation needs to happen. Not not every piece of information is best disseminated via a long article. It could be a short post. It could be an audio event like we're having right now on this podcast. It could be a video. And so when I'm thinking about my own interviews or the reporting that I'm doing, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about what is the best way to deliver this information. So for example, we have a um, series coming out around International Women's Day on the state of women at work. And that is uh, based on a lot of LinkedIn data that we're releasing that kind of shows trends of how women, particularly here in the US, have fared um, in their careers throughout the pandemic. And that's just a ton of information that I, I don't think would be best served in, in, a, in a video interview, but instead needs, needs, to be, needs to rely back to kind of traditional forms of journalism, so long form articles. But not everything is like that. And so I think when it comes to meeting audiences where they are, making sure that the information is, is, is easy to consume and clear, um, content type is probably where I start every lens of conversation with and then move from there. And you've, you've kind of seen how that, I know that you're um, a user of the LinkedIn platform as well, um, Lloyd. So you kind of see that you've seen that evolve too as our product has evolved. When I started at LinkedIn, the only way that you could share information or publish anything was in a long form, a long form article. Um, now you can post to the feed, you can host a live video event, you can now host live audio events. Uh, so we're always trying to think about what is the best way that we can, we can share this information with our members. 
If we look more broadly at trends in journalism, we, we've seen major uh, news outlets, uh, the New York Times, Washington Post, uh, uh, Wall Street Journal, and also your outlets, uh, LinkedIn most notably, and building uh, the news division at LinkedIn. We've seen those larger outlets grow in terms of their subscribership, their readership, um, and their impact. But a lot of local newspapers and local news organizations are really struggling. As you think about building LinkedIn News and the other platforms you're involved in, how, how do you, what do you think about in terms of local news? Uh, it used to be that, that people in communities really received most of their news from their local news outlet, whether it was a community newspaper or maybe it was a radio station that had news. Of course, that's changing now. And yet a lot of the, the, the news that was previously covered now doesn't really get covered in any outlet. How, how do you see that? And, and what might be the response of LinkedIn News or other organizations to this, um, I would say, in, in a sense, consolidation of news organizations? Right. Yeah, I mean, it, this, I think, is, is the billion-dollar question, right? How are we going to fix this issue of local news outlets by the day it seems like shutting down and people not being able to get information at a local level? But going back to our conversation around creators and the creator economy, this is where I think some of this stuff is going to come full circle. I think as you think about the number of people who are, are creating content right now on the Internet, that offers an opportunity for people who are sharing more information at a local level to create audiences. And I think what we know is that there, there's a hunger for that type of information. So the gatekeeping that I mentioned earlier in terms of you know, these traditional players holding on to all the information and being the only way that you could access it, with that being kind of getting dismantled by the creator economy, I think we're gonna see a lot of opportunities to disrupt the traditional model for how newsrooms make money. Because at the end of the day, that's ultimately what's happening here is that there, you know, the, the supply and demand for, for local news is not meeting in a way that is allowing these newsrooms to, to stay profitable and stay in business. And so I think as the creator economy continues to grow, and it's not just newsrooms who are delivering information, but it's, you know, maybe it's it's some credible a uh, person who's has a TikTok account and can get millions of followers based on you know sharing stories and information about what's going on in, in her local city. Um, so I think that that is is really where we're going to see a lot of innovation and growth and hopefully opportunities for more localized um, information will, will will crop up. If we move on to some broader questions and topics related to leadership, as a nation, we've seen high numbers of open positions and people leaving the workforce. Based on your perspective at LinkedIn and having interviewed some of the most successful business leaders, what does this say about the future of employment? I think the future of employment is flexibility. If this pandemic hasn't shown us anything, it's that people can really work on their own schedule and, and still be productive for companies. I think back to what we were covering in terms of the changing nature of work and the future of the workplace prior to the coronavirus. And it was kind of like this, this big question mark surrounding, can flexible work work? And because there wasn't a crisis like the pandemic that forced employers basically overnight to send their, their, their knowledge workers home to work remotely, um, it, it bored out this huge experiment where a lot of companies are still, you know, we're three years into this crisis at this point, two years into this crisis, I should say, um, employers are still saying, yeah, this, this works. And, you know, forefront employers like LinkedIn and Microsoft are leaning even more into flexibility at this point in the pandemic. And so prior to the pandemic, this was the number one perk that we saw workers across the board asking for, particularly working women is, is flexibility. And now that that's born out and born to be successful, I think that the best employers who are going to retain the most talent, particularly given just the high rate of people who are rethinking their careers right now, are going to be those who really meet workers where they are and, and trust them that they can they can structure their, their days um, how they like and, and can make work fit into their lives. And so I think that that's going to be the big trend that we're going to continue to explore moving um, into this year and, and beyond. One of the challenges of remote work, of course, is, is how to develop community in the workplace. And I was wondering, Caroline, in, in your team at LinkedIn, which I'm sure has been largely remote, or and you probably have team members around the globe, certainly in your global activities, but how do you build that sense of community when 
you're probably working with people that that you've never met and you may not meet. I was talking with a tech leader recently and they have tens of thousands of people working in the tech industry now that have never actually physically been in a facility associated with a tech company. Um, and of course that that's likely to continue in some form, but how do we build community uh, that oftentimes is what influences organizational culture and helps to sustain organizational culture? How do we do that in a predominantly or exclusively remote environment? Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating question, and it's one that I, I personally am fascinated by. We have hundreds of uh, new colleagues at LinkedIn who we've uh, who I'm now interacting with who have who started after the pandemic. Who in some cases I have never met in person. It's one of the top questions that I ask them is is what is this what's this experience been like? If you think about culture, company culture, and you think about the politics of the workplace, I. There's, there's thousands of things I think I've picked up on based on my colleagues just by simply interacting with them in person in the office every day. And so now we're asking people to be onboarded into organizations and not have that day-to-day -day connectivity or not have, you know, those those water cooler moments, if you will, of, of you know, talking about things outside of work or the, you know, the critical conversations that happen when you're leaving a conference room to go back to your desk that might be, you know, answer the question that could take months to answer uh, virtually because you don't have those little touch points. So honestly, I don't think that anyone has really figured this out. Companies like LinkedIn have done a, done a re really remarkable job of continuing to provide kind of touch points for people to get together. Uh, I can just speak for, for my team here in New York. You know, we try and I try and go in the office about once once a week. And when I do go in the office, I try to have as many one on one in person meetings as possible. But what I will say is that I think the thing that we still need to figure out is that hybrids here to stay. Uh, there's going to be people who continue to work from home, uh, who want to work from home exclusively. They work better that way. And so I think what we still need to figure out is, you know, in a, in a world in which maybe half the team is in the office and half the team dialing into the meeting is coming on over Zoom, how do we make that an equitable, uh, equitable situation, particularly when we know from data both on and off LinkedIn that people who are probably going to work from home at a higher rate are women as well as other underrepresented groups. And so we need to ensure that as we move into hybrid, that people aren't getting left behind. And I think that that is a question that most business leaders are, are is keeping them up at night right now. And I don't necessarily think that we have a, a silver bullet solution. Those are great points. I, I wonder if some of this is Generation, uh, generationally related, you know, as Gen Z enters the workforce, how do you foresee work environments changing? And, and maybe how are those work environments perhaps best tailored to generational changes in outlook and expectations of work and culture? And how should we as leaders adjust to these generational changes? Yeah, you know, I think I think what's refreshing is that Gen Z in particular is coming into the workplace with a, a much more refreshing view of, of what work looks like and what success looks like. I think back, to, I just think about my own generation, the millennial generation, who is known for just being obsessive about work and finding most of that, their identity and passion and self-worth come from what they do vocationally and in, a, in an unhealthy way to a certain extent. And Gen Z is coming up and actually saying, like, look, I'll even take a pay cut if I can have more flexibility with my schedule. And and they're they're thinking differently. They're more likely, obviously, to to spend um, a fewer amount of years with an employer as opposed to spending you know seven years at LinkedIn, which you know is is an extraordinary amount of time in this day and age to be at the same company, given um, the trends that Gen Z is bringing up. And so I think what that really means is you know employers have to think about the value proposition that they're that they're putting out to employees. What are they offering beyond just a nine to five? Uh, I think if you went back two decades ago, um, you know, it might, the conversation you might have with a recruiting manager might be around, oh, you know, LinkedIn is a great place for you to spend your career. I think that that's, and that certainly is the case. Uh, but I think that a lot of members of the Gen Z generation are, are not thinking like that. They're not thinking like, oh, I want to go to a, one company and stay there for 10 years. They're thinking, how can, they're more thinking about what, what can I learn in the next 12 months that's going to open up more opportunities for the next, next what might be next. Um, I was just listening earlier today to an interview that our editor-in-chief, Dan Roth, was doing with uh, the CEO of Marriott. And he was kind of 
he was probing him, I think rightfully so on this topic. The CEO of Marriott was just talking about how Marriott is a great place to grow in your career. And uh, I don't think that that's necessarily how this next generation is thinking. So I think the the challenge for employers is really meeting them where they are, both with what they're expecting when it comes to flexibility and remote work, but also selling the case, if you will, of why this is a good place for them to be for a year, two years, seven years, whatever it may be. As host of LinkedIn Live, you've had one-on-ones with some of the most dynamic leaders in business and philanthropy. What are some of the most memorable lessons about leadership that you've learned from these interviews? And have you integrated any of these lessons into your own work? Certainly. Um, I think probably the biggest lesson that I've learned, particularly through this pandemic, is just the importance of being prepared. Uh, I, I see the gambit when I interview particularly CEOs um, of, of, of them either coming in very prepared for the interview, you know, knowing, knowing who I am, um, knowing uh, some of my work, et cetera. And then those who you can tell that they've kind of read maybe a paragraph written by their PR person, but besides that, have really no idea what the interview is about and they don't really necessarily um, know about me. And the best interviews, and I think some of the most remarkable leaders that um, I've interviewed, they all come in very prepared. Um, and I think that that is a testament to probably how they how they interact with every aspect of their business, whether it's something small like an interview with me or something maybe larger like a, a, a meeting with shareholders that could have implications for the business. Uh, one in particular that comes to mind is um, Indra Nui, who was um, you know CEO for PepsiCo for, for multiple years. I got the opportunity to interview you her um, around the time that her book came out last year. And, you know, you wouldn't, have, you, this is a very, very, very busy woman, but you would have thought that the 30 minutes that she had with me that day were the most important 30 minutes of her entire day. And I can tell that that's probably the, the um, impression that she gives to everyone that she works with. She told me um, a story about, you know, one of the things that she does is that She's a big fan of, of handwriting notes, and she told me a few stories um, in our interview around times that writing a handwritten note, whether it's to an employee at PepsiCo or to you know a family member, how that's kind of how she connects, and it's just kind of that thoughtfulness. And so, for me, I I, I prepare for everything and I over prepare, uh, and I think that that is something that I've always seen from particularly like the strongest leaders that I've interviewed. They 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 come prepared for everything. It sounds. Very simple, and when, even when, and as I'm saying out loud, it sounds so simple, but you'd be surprised at how many people I've spoken to who I feel like don't come prepared uh, for, for an interview. That really resonates, certainly in my experience as well, and, and I think there's, there's nothing that substitutes for preparation, and, um, and I think that's going to be a constant, right? I mean, we've talked a lot about remote work, hybrid work. Um, we're still navigating a huge number of challenges related to uh, to the pandemic, but uh, the more we're able to prepare ourselves, the more we're able to uh, understand our environment um, and how it impacts others, I think the better we're going to be as leaders. Yeah. I think the only thing that I'll also add to that is I think the strongest leaders too are willing to admit what they don't know and willing to admit when uncertainty is is at the forefront of an issue. I think to like some of the moments throughout this pandemic where, you know, whether it was my manager or it was um, our team lead kind of saying like, we're, we're figuring this out as we go along. And I think that that transparency of being able to say, we, we don't know what we don't know is, is really a, a tenant that I think the best leaders are going to need moving forward as well. Yes, for all of us, uh, this is our first pandemic, right? There aren't <laughs> many people around who um, were around for the previous one in, in 1918. And, um, and we are all learning by doing and learning by the feedback that, that we're getting and hopefully heeding. As we continue to navigate the uncertainties of the pandemic, is, is there a particular skill or set of skills that you think leaders should focus on developing I think empathy is a big one. Uh, I, I, so my career, I've mostly focused on um, equity in the workplace um, and professional women. And so even prior to this pandemic, majority of the leaders that I sat down with were women. Um, and empathy is a trait that is, is typically associated, for better or for worse, with, with the, the female gender. But what I think is really fascinating is, despite the hundreds of CEOs and executives that I sat down with prior to the pandemic, I think the word empathy probably came up in discussion a handful of times, if that, 
Uh, whereas now, I don't think I've sat down with a single executive since this pandemic who hasn't brought up the importance of empathetic leadership. And really what that tells you is just the, the giant lens that this, this crisis put on the fact that your employees are not robots. They have full and robust lives outside of, outside of work. I mean, you're, I'm talking to you from my home right now. I can hear my dog outside. My husband is on the phone upstairs. And so that, that lens of not viewing your workers as you know, people who come into the office and then power down at the end of the day and don't exist outside of the, the four walls of, of your building, I think that, had, that was completely disrupted. And so this idea of being empathetic to the fact that people have lives outside of work, they probably have passions and they're dealing with problems outside of work. In the case of the pandemic, a lot of those problems were healthcare related, unfortunately, for a lot of people. I think really shifted the way that leaders need to think about how they interact with their employees, how they communicate with them. And I think that all comes back down to this trait of, of empathy. Caroline, what's next for you at LinkedIn? Are you working on any exciting projects? Yeah, to- always working on exciting projects. The LinkedIn product is, is constantly evolving, so we always have fun things to to work with. Right now, uh, one of the things that I'm most excited about is that we are um, – we're rolling out LinkedIn audio events. So typical to like a clubhouse feature, uh, which you might have heard of, uh, we can have these uh, conversations on the platform that are audio only. And, you know, at the beginning of this pandemic, we started a daily live show on LinkedIn where five days a week we were talking to business leaders about uh, leadership and management through this pandemic. And um, that, that was a video based show. I think, you know, we, we had, I think, over 300 episodes of it. And we learned a lot about video uh, through that venture. And now we're just exploring audio only. And I've hosted a couple of audio events since the product uh, came out. And it's, it's so cool. It's, it's such a different, more intimate feeling. And I also feel like um, people in the audience are more likely to participate in the discussion because they don't have to turn their camera on and, and say hello uh, to everyone on the other side, but they can just speak. And so that's really what, what I'm excited about um, is, is exploring more of that and seeing what kind of conversations we can foster over, over audio. In closing, what gives you hope for the future of journalism and fact-based reporting? Uh, so much. I think at the end of the day, you know, this trend of of misinformation is troubling. This trend of, you know, people not feeling like they can trust uh, news outlets is is troubling. But I think at the end of the day, there's always going to be a desire and a need for for fact-based reporting, as you said, and for quality journalism. I think right now, as we've discussed a little bit in this conversation, the business model is being completely disrupted and, you know, it, it's, it'll continue to get disrupted. But I think fundamentally, at the end of the day, the business of journalism needs to work because people need journalism. And so, you know, whether it's venture bets like Dan Roth made almost a decade ago to start a newsroom at LinkedIn or it's figuring out how Fortune Magazine can continue to help to tell the important conversations that they're having in magazine print form. I think all of these questions will come to some sort of resolution in favor of fact-based reporting and quality journalism because it's, it's a crucial part of our democracy. And I'm just happy to be a, a very, very small part of it. Well, Caroline, thank you so much. And thank you for listening to The Minor Consult with me, Stanford School of Medicine Dean Lloyd Minor. I hope you enjoyed today's insightful discussion with the editor-at-large for LinkedIn News and host of LinkedIn News Live, Caroline Fairchild. If you haven't already, I encourage you to check out our other Minor Consult podcasts with guests like science writer Carl Zimmer, film producer Jennifer Todd, and famed political strategist James Carville. To get the latest episodes of The Minor Consult, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate the podcast five stars. Your feedback helps make this podcast happen. Thank you so much for joining me today. I look forward to our next episode. Until then, stay safe, stay well, and be kind.